good to see both of you. You look great. Hello, all you beautiful freaks. Let's get some uh, quick rules out of the way. Real quick, if you could just put your cell phones on silent or vibrate. Do not take any phone calls while you're in the room. And flash and video photography are permitted until our guests tire of it, and then we ask that you respect their wishes and cease to do so. We're going to set up two mics in the audience, one in each aisle. If you'll just line up on those mics, be sure to kneel down so the people behind you can see. You can start asking some questions. Right, and this is for me, not Julia, because Julia has a class. But I always like to say that you guys can ask me anything you want. Anything. Uh, I won't necessarily answer anything you ask. But you can go ahead. Yeah, throw it on. Alright, let's start on this side of the room if we could. Hello. do that job. Like after 13 books. When I first did it, it was, it was so embarrassing. Because A, it is the hardest job I've ever done. But literally, when I come home from doing an audiobook, I'm just curled in a fetal position. My brain has just turned off. Um, because I guess, you know, for a play, you might, if you're doing a one-man show, you might be on stage for an hour and a half to three hours, just by yourself, you know, performing. Um, with film, it's all stop and go, so you have time to rest. But with audiobooks, it's eight to ten hours of just go. And so, so it's tiring. And, and you, you, um, you're interrupted every 30 seconds because, like, uh, take a sip of water, you're just a little bit dry in the mouth, James. You know, <laughs> or, you know, that, that was the, and you said and, or, you know, whatever the thing is. And, and you're trying not to get frustrated by being stopped all the time after you're working, trying to hold on to the characters. And, but that's just the nature of the beast. That's what it is. And if you don't like it, get another job, basically. And I remember when I fir first did the first Harry Dresden book, I wanted to run away screaming. I was just like, I can't take this out now! And I was telling him, like, no, man, if I get some words wrong, it's not important. Uh, the overarching thing is important. They want the dirt, man. The, the, the microphone wants the dirt, not everything clean. You know, let's not be careful. And it's exactly the opposite is true, right? Because someone spent a lot of time writing these words, and you know. Um, but now I'm really enjoying it, and uh, I really uh, I'm in the middle of, of the next one right now. Oh, yeah. Um, and what I like about Jim Butcher is he's able to make the main character Harry more powerful with each book. But, like, Harry will get this much more powerful, but the, wor the world around him gets this much more weird, you know? And so, uh, and he's able to do that without making it seem artificial. Uh, it all seems to be an organic kind of thing that, that you know, the, the lines, the reasons that the world is getting weirder go back books and books and books, and it all makes sense, and, yeah, I'm having a blast. You're welcome. How about over here?
truth. I mean, I had a, I had my job was really hard when going to work meant working with James and working with David. So I kind of had, you know, it was a, it was a good gig. You're welcome. Hey, um, my question is for both of you. Thank you for coming today. Um, James, I know you at least have done some work writing comic books before, uh, specifically a, a Buffy and uh, it was a Spike and Drew book. Yeah. But as the mythos continues and, and comics become more important to the Buffy storyline, have you guys thought about doing any work in that area? That's probably best for Julia to start with. Yeah. Um, I co-wrote two issues of the Angel comic book about Drew with uh, Brian Lynch a couple years ago. And uh, that was lots of fun. And then I actually started doing a five issue arc uh, with um, Dark Horse, and we got through, we sort of have three of the issues done, but then I've been working back to back, uh, got two different movies, and I'm now starting another project. And so we're just trying to figure out scheduling, and hopefully we'll be able to, to, to finish it up. So we'll see. Yeah, um, yeah and I wrote that one. Um, Years ago, I, I had just come from producing theater and I mistakenly thought that if I wrote in Hollywood, I'd have more power, like I used to have in theater. And I was wrong. Um, <laughs> in that one, I, I tried to, uh, to rip Spike and Drew as far away from each other as po humanly possible, or the furthest that I could make the two characters, and then find a good reason for them to get back together throughout the comic book. Um, I was just talking with uh, one of the Dark Horse writers, I think it was the head editor, backstage at the last Comic Con in San Diego, and I pitched him an idea that I gave to Joss for a Spike TV movie that didn't go off. Um, it never happened. And um, uh, you've heard this before, but I'll ramble on for a while. It was so funny. Oh, Joss was, we were, I was on the phone with Joss, and I was like, man, yeah, Spike TV movie, cool. What, what do you got? What, what ideas do you got? He goes, I got nothing. <laughs> I got, what, I, what I do have, I have a line from a movie. I'm like, oh, okay, wait, what is it? And it's Aragorn from, um, from uh, the, the last uh, Lord of the Rings film. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he, and he says, uh, it's, uh, I have no hope for myself, but I have hope for others. Whatever. The, the, the line went before he goes off the battle, he knows he's going to die. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really serious. <laughs> okay, how about this, Joss? And I said, um, what I would like to do for the character is to have him plan to do something and for, get something for himself and proactively go out and achieve that. Because we've never seen him do that. <laughs> but, and, 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 but it should be something very small that he is able to achieve. Because if it's something grandiose, it's going to ring false. So, how about this? How about Spike is homeless. He is... He's gotten away from Angel and Buffy. He's not under their wings anymore. He's trying to make it in the real world. And he's now got a soul, so he can't rob anybody for food. He can't steal. He can't lie. But he was damned if he's going to get a job. So, <laughs> his, like, his coat is falling apart. His boots are falling apart. He tries to save someone in an alley, but his boots are flapping around and it messes him up. Um, and he notices these new pair of boots in the, in the store window. And they're perfect, but he has no money. And he, and he gets run off by the two Chinese, uh, the, the old husband and wife Chinese couple, want him gone because he's like a homeless guy. And uh, he hears about a big monster that's come to town, so he decides that he wants to be a hero about that. He meets a, a woman um, that, uh, that he falls in love with, but he doesn't have the guts to tell her that he's a vampire, so it's really funny how he tries to cover that up through the comic book. Yeah, through the whole comic book, he's trying to figure out how, how am I going to get those boots? Because I have no money, <laughs> but, but I can't go in there and steal them. And then he remembers that about a hundred years ago, he pulled, up, he pulled up a, a robbery and stored, the gang stored their money underneath the floorboards of that, of that store. And so he's like, how do I get at that without breaking in, without lying to them? How do I do that? trying to figure out how to be moral in this world. And uh, he, finally, he finally meets the monster. He, 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 uh, he gets the monster in an alleyway, at which point the monster unfurls from human height to about four feet, four, maybe four times human height, huge, and he has to run away. And he's like, uh, I need a librarian. Uh, I need a witch. Uh, I need a nerd. You know? <laughs> 
so, and in the fight, the woman sees him fighting, realizes she's a vampire, is horrified, and dumps him. That's okay. And, and so, you know, he's walking back, and he finally goes, you know, screw it. I'm just going to tell this couple that they have this money under their floorboards. Maybe they'll give me a reward. I don't know. So he goes in there and tells them, and the, the, the wife's like, oh, thank you very much. Goodbye. And kicks him out. And he's going up, and the, the man runs behind him and says, look, I saw you uh, looking at the boots before. It's not much, because you just gave us like half a million dollars. But here, here's a pair of boots. So he loses the girl, loses the fight, but gets a pair of boots for himself. And that's, that's it. And Joss goes, Joss goes, God, I like that. That's cheap. <laughs> And I go, yeah, boss, I wrote it for you. That's <laughs> before they were shoving, you know, $180 million out of it to make a movie. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you give Joss Whedon a budget, he'll give you a movie every time. Over here. Okay, my question's for James. Um, do you like playing the evil torture Spike better, or the Spike at the end of Buffy that's like nice and tries to do good? They were both awesome, but what I found was, like when you're the hero, you're always having to feel guilty about something. You're always trying to, you're always having, most especially, you're always running from A to B, sweating, feeling guilty. Whereas if you're the, if you're the, the, the villain, you're just lurking in an alleyway, <laughs> waiting for the villain to run by, and then you pop him in the head and you go home. And it's easy. And the script will build you up exactly as powerful and cool as the hero, so that when the end fight comes, it's an equal match. You just have to be comfortable with losing that fight, and it's an easy job. And you, don't have to, you don't have to dredge up all this pain from your past or anything. So yeah, evil, 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 evil. Yeah, I love villain. We also we also age well, so I will be, I will be, I want to have like, I want to be the new Count Dooku, you know, 80 years old with a lightsaber. <laughs> Question over here. Hi, if you could do a show together that's running now, what would it be? TV show? Any show. invites a guy that he barely knows from work over for dinner and they're so excited to have this guy over and they have this pathetic little dinner party but every like 15 to 20 seconds one of the characters will turn to the audience and say how they're really feeling oh, so they'll yeah. be like hi well so so and, and that, that was an interesting thing you said I don't, remember. I don't remember what they said I'm sweating bullets what am I gonna do <laughs> <laughs> the woman ends up on the table in the middle of the of the of the of dinner party, this is her inner monologue, so no one else finds it. She ends up on the table talking about her. Oh, uh, sorry, no, that's too much. No, well, her, her fantasy of 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 of, of having uh, a, a tryst with the garbage men that come every morning. <laughs> <laughs> but it really it, it put my theater company on the map in Seattle. It's just like it a hysterical. sure fire play. And I'm Funny, it. right? Yeah. 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 Cool. I want to read it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Question over here. Uh, yeah, the Whedon universe is known for reusing and using actors they've had before, so given that and what was announced last week, which one of you would look better in a S.H.I.E.L.D. uniform? <laughs> I 
I think Juliet would look good in any uniform. This has been like 30 years in the making. I mean, this, this, is, this is long overdue. Mm -hmm. That's great. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's off to Jonas. All right. All right. Question over here. Um, would you mind doing 30 second impersonations of Spike and Drusilla for us? Can you Bloody do hell, I've moved on with my life. I don't do that anymore. Drew, don't you agree? I thought we've moved on for a while. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> We've got other parts of ourselves, don't we? We haven't shown everything to everybody. Maybe. Yeah. has <laughs> got all sorts of different colours and different notes within it that you've never even seen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Next question over here. all the Buffy episodes right now and I'm just watching all the <laughs> great scenes and I'm thinking all of the clothes back then are so different from now. What would Drew and Spike be wearing these days? I don't know. I mean Drew's style was always this sort of, the, the idea was a little bit of the uh, obviously Victorian look so I, I think that I that character always sort of had that but the idea then was a cross between that and the heroine chic fashion look so with the nails and all the stuff I'm not sure what now now I do I'd raid them all kill some people and steal some clothes yeah. <laughs> and Spike basically got one costume for seven years it was like Gilligan's Island and I don't think I could give him another one to work out but it was a cool coat. Yeah, it's a good coat. <laughs> and like, I never had to worry. Everybody else was always like talking to the costume department. Did I have a jacket in the last one? Should I bring it in A B? What shoes did I wear? I'm like, I'm done. I'm, I'll be in my trailer. At least you weren't like in a corset for 16 hours a day. <laughs> or were you? <laughs> Let's take another question from over here. Oh. Hi, this is for both of you because you were both on the Angel, but not part of Angel Investigations. Yeah. So how did that feel like on the set? To be how? on the Angel set, but not be a part of the... You know, for me, being on Buffy and Angel felt like one big set, even though they shot in different areas. Uh, we shot Angel primarily, the, the home base was the Paramount lot, and we shot on the west side for Buffy. But so many of the cast and crew that we worked with on one worked on the other, and I was always working with the same group of actors. Primarily, I was working with James, David, and Julie, and Sarah, you know, but so on Angel, it was with those, those people. So it kind of just felt very similar, extending the character from, from one to the next. It, it didn't feel all that different, really. And our, uh, you know, camera op on Buffy became a DP of Angel, so, you know, it really was like one big family. Yeah, as as I was and, concerned. you know, as far as being an outsider, so to speak, on that, it was the same for both of us on Buffy and Angel. We were outsiders. The thing is, the the, the 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 show was written by a guy and writers that felt like outsiders growing up. It was really about the anyone in the world who feels like an outsider, which is yeah. everyone in the world. Oh, hello. And um, and so we kind of got to be the uber outsiders. And then I don't know if they planned it that way, but it was a delicious place to be, and I think yeah. that's for, to some extent why the characters took off like they did. And I just had a good time, both in Buffy and Angel. Um, in all honesty, 
Where David and Sarah are both great people, but they had to be treated with deference because that's what you do to a lead on a on a Hollywood uh, set. And I was always deferential in between takes, but once they said action, I got to just tear into them. <laughs> I'm a subversive artist, so I was looking for action every time. Like I want to take you down. <laughs> yeah. This is to make you look right on. Angel Investigations, Cordelia Chase. Right on, thank you. Right on. Thank you. Right on. Let's take another question from over here. Uh, hello, oh, for, first, my name is Charlie, I'm a huge fan of Anne, and my question is for both of you. Um, what episode of either Buffy or Angel did, did, did you most enjoy filming? I have three. <laughs> um, I enjoyed School Hard because it was our first episode and it was really delicious to step into these roles and, and get to play together and, and James is such a fantastic actor and it really felt right from the get-go like a tennis match or a dance or, you know, I, I never exactly knew what was going to happen with him and, you know, it just really, there was a fluidity to working that was just really, really creative. And uh, my second episode would be Surprise, uh, where I get strong and we assemble the big blue guy, the judge, and that was fun for me. And then the last one would be an episode of Angel uh, Reunion, where Julie and I team up and uh, kill all the lawyers. I like that. <laughs> yes. I have to agree with Julie. School Heart is right up there. School Heart. I, I had no idea what I was in for yet, so that was a good time. Um, I, I'd have to say my favorite memory, specifically, of a scene was I don't know the name of this one, but it was the one where we were in Mexico breaking up with the mucus demon. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I remember us, we were so committed to making it real, to making it real, and, the, and like the more, and the more passionate and real we became, the funnier the scene became, because all the, the guy was just dripping behind us, yeah. and, and I just, we would do a take, and we'd be all like this, and we'd look back, and we'd be like, oh my god. True. Although I was having to go, okay, so I left James for the chaos. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. But that's how pathetic I was at that point. <laughs> you can't kill a slayer. Well, it's your fault you had that thing for Buffy going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I can't even try to kill her. That's silly. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> right on. The musical, also a big high point. Yeah. yeah. Mainly because none of us had any faith in Joss whatsoever <laughs> to write music at all. He, he gave us a cassette tape of the music instead of a script that week. And oh I always like to say, no writer can survive a bad performance. Not even Shakespeare. Like, one of the worst things you can do is go see a bad Shakespeare play. They're just, you want to rend your flesh, you know? <laughs> so even the world's greatest writer cannot withstand a bad performance. And whereas Josh can write good music, see, he was playing the music and singing it with his wife, Guy. And they're both amazing people, some of my favorite people in the world, but they're not singers. <laughs> <laughs> they're not like musicians or anything. So I would play, press play and I was hearing this and I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is horrible. This is terrible. And I walked out of the, the, the trailer and the rest of the cast are coming into the sunlight blinking with the same expression. <laughs> it's confusion and disgust. <laughs> and, and, and so it started off badly. <laughs> and we all tried to talk Joss out of it and nobody could do it. And we really thought that he'd gone insane <laughs> out of the pressure of making the show or out of an ego gratification for the show doing well. Something was happening to Joss and he was going to flush all of our careers down the toilet. <laughs> and at some point we realized that we weren't going to get out of it and the, the best response in the face of that was to try our best. And we really kind of stopped whining and we worked really hard. There was a lot of uh, vocal coaches that came in, dance instructors that came in, and we really kind of battened down the hatches and did our best in the face of sure destruction. <laughs> and it ended up working great. And I remember when Joss finished cutting the Xander dance, and 
he wheeled in on television on the set and he showed it to us to show us, look, I'm not an idiot like you think I am. And it was fabulous. And I remember this feeling of everybody just going, wow, this is actually going to fly. This is, oh my God. And so we went from abject depression to, to elation uh, in one thing. And I've never been more proud of us as a company because we really did, you know, come up with the goods when we thought it was just going to fail anyway. Yeah. Yes, this side of the room. recently saw Buffy again since the last when it originally aired and I uh, I was watching it and I saw you two and I said there's something different about those two and I Google you know I Google I'm like oh a different theater of course and so <laughs> and so I did all this research and inspection of your work and really what I wanted to know is is there a process that you go through to prepare to jump from one to the other because it's a completely different way that it's the technique is completely different. <laughs> so is there like something you go through? Wow. Well, well, for me, every role has its, is like its own recipe and takes its own ingredients. I have certain ways that I work. I think every actor has a way that they work that works for them. And that continues to grow and develop and change as you work. Um, I don't actually find stage and film that different in terms of my process, I find it different in terms of some of the technicality, in terms of how intimate when a camera is right here and it's close up, you know, just thinking something communicates and when you have to vocally reach like the back wall there, it's, it's just different in those certain technical ways. But in terms of as, as a performer, I basically choose my ingredients. I always, you know, do whatever prep is necessary for each particular scene and then I let it fly. <laughs> and that's kind of the process. I am totally different. Like, I feel like I could talk from my perspective. Like I could talk all day about the differences for me between film and, and theater. Like I always like to say, like in theater, do you know guys know Benny Hanna? Do you have that restaurant here where the guy, the chef, comes out and he chops one right behind us? Right on. Yeah, the chef comes to your table, chops up the food, and cooks it and serves it to you in one thing. So on stage, you're the Benny Hanna chef. And all the script, the costumes, the makeup, all of those are just your ingredients to create a moment with an audience and serve it to them and for which they pay. So um, when, you're a, when you're a film actor, you're just a piece of celery. <laughs> and, and, and the editor is going to chop it up later and serve it to the audience. And you're not part of that. So, so they, they hammer into you in acting school, you are a storyteller. You have to tell a story. And in theater, if you try to tell the story, you will be caught acting and it will be plastic and fake and artificial and it will just fall down. Great example of this is in school art. When I come in and I'm, I'm making my big entrance, right? Now in theater, when you make a big entrance, you go to the frame of whatever you're entering through, usually a door, you stand in the frame because it's a good strong image, you say your first line, the first few words of your line very loudly, you pause, then you move, and you enter stage, and continue talking. It's just an old trick. So I tried that, forgetting I'm wearing a mic. I don't have to talk loud. I, the camera cuts to me. I don't have to pause for no specific reason anymore. And, it's, and it, it becomes this big theatrical moment which doesn't ring true. And I remember watching that and just being like, I have got to flush. Everything, I, everything I've learned, and just, I remember just paying attention to you, Julia, you and, um, and, and Giles, who I thought never cared about anything, he never did anything, until I saw him on film, and I was like, oh my God. So, uh, yeah, a, a universe of difference, and, and the big one is just, um, be the freshest little piece of celery that you can. <laughs> and be honest, yeah. Let's go back over here. Hi. Hey, bro. I've been uh, reading the comic books and stuff that have been coming out after the series is done, season nine, season eight, and the uh, Angel After the Fall. And I was wondering if you guys had had any input on where your characters went, like Spike becoming the king of a bunch of alien bugs, <laughs> and Julia, I mean, uh, Drusilla becoming the mother superior of a cult of emotion sucked uh, vampires and demons? Over to you, Jay. No. <laughs> I, 
I have exactly as much input that I did on Buffy. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. I, I always used to think they can make me do anything they want on this show, and I'll say anything they want me to say, but how the audience reacts to me, that's my job. And so, yeah, I think that they were, they were this is a side note, but I think in a lot of respects, Joss was uncomfortable with you guys liking Spike so much. <laughs> because in his world, vampires are, are a metaphor for the problems that you overcome in life. And so you're not supposed to like those problems, you're supposed to defeat them and move on. And that wasn't happening. So he was trying to get you guys not to like me so much. I'm like, no, 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 no. You write the story, I connect with the audience. That's just how it works. I wanted a job. I'm like, yeah, your theme. Okay, that's great. That's good for the world. I need, I need a job. <laughs> Hi, what's your question? Hi, um, my question is, do you miss working on Buffy and Angel? And if you do, what do you miss the most about it? Um, I loved working on Buffy and Angel. It was a fantastic number of years. It was amazing. Um, I've all. I, I love all the projects I've, I've worked on. So many incredible. I mean, the thing to me about being an actor, the thing I love about being an actor is getting to play a range of roles. And in the last year, I've played everything from a Bronx chick to a, a Viennese movie star to an English missionary. To you know, and it's to me that I find that really exciting. But that said, I, I loved every minute of working on Buffy and Angel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. Uh, I miss most of all. I miss the word action. Because uh, when they say action, everyone has to shut up and I get to go. And usually it's just waiting for that magical word and I can escape into the fantasy. Uh, and all of the different pieces are all arranged for that moment. And um, I miss the writers. You know, these, these writers have gone on to be big time writers, big time producers as all the shows on TV. But we had them when there were nine of them all together, poor hungry and working together to make us look good so uh, I miss that and I miss being terrified because oftentimes in Buffy like if you do a stage show or a movie you can read a script and you can decide do I want to give that or do I want to go through that and sometimes the answer is yes sometimes frankly it's no no thank you and you don't do that um, on a TV series, once you do the pilot, you basically know what you're going to be asked to do because it's basically the same thing every time, right? But with Buffy, it was, it, who knows what they're going to ask me to do? Who knows what part of myself I'm going to have to reveal? There's no, there, it's all bar, it's all, there's no end to it. And at some point, I became physically sick with terror about getting new scripts. And in hindsight, at the time, it was just, it was kind of painful, but in hindsight, I realized, as an artist, that's exactly where you want to be. So I missed that too. Hi, what's your question? This question is for James. How hard was it to keep a straight face when you were filming the little fight scene with Puppet Angel? <laughs> Thank God I didn't have to, you know, I mean, like, I, uh, I, I was beating myself up off camera with that puppet. I had the puppets. And it was just delicious. It was like, I remember Ben England wrote that. He wrote The Tick. And this was one of my favorite cartoons. It's about mediocre superheroes. It's just fabulous. And I've been waiting for that script the whole season, and it finally came out, and I was only in one scene. And I went, Ben, what's wrong, man? That could be funny. Come on. And he's like, dude, I gave you the gold. Just take it and go rest. And, and he was right. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just had to like, kind of like whack myself and laugh and make fun of Angel, which is really fun anyway. <laughs> Hi, what's your question? Hi, uh, first up, I love you guys. I've been rewatching the series um, since when I was a little kid and stuff, but my biggest issue in rewatching it was that Buffy lies to all of her friends and to just everybody in the show. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on her lying to everybody and trying to protect them in that sense. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think um, that was one of the things that I was very impressed by with the scripts was admitting what a dicey situation you get into in life when you define yourself as a hero. 
because most people in real life who do that are jerks. You know, we're all, you know, humility is, is probably the beginning of wisdom. And once you say that I am here to save you, you're, you're not on the right path, man. And, uh, and you know, and, and it, I thought that it was a very honest examination of someone who's rather forced into the situation of having to be a hero and what that does to your relationships and how it does force you or you think at the moment it forces you to lie to your friends, to keep things from them and the, the, the emotional cost of having to distance yourself from the people that you need the most. So I, I thought it was, again, a, you know, a, a really honest evaluation of what the real ramifications would be if you had a super suit. Yeah, I think that's one of you know, the genius of Joss and the writing is that none of the characters are it, you know, black and white. I mean, that was one of the things that was so incredible about the role that I played is there were so many di different dimensions and often you play a villain and it's just like, I'm evil, you know? <laughs> and it had so many things. And same with, with Buffy, it's not, you know, people are a myriad of things and nobody is just one thing. And even if they're doing great things, there's some parts that are a little less than great in everybody <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah, to the point where some directors would come in and they wouldn't have like directed a lot on the show and they would ask me to do something particularly villainous and I'd be like, oh, would, would you like me to do one of these? Because, you know, that's, that's you know, really on the nose. We could do that. <laughs> like, dude, this is Buffy. It's not all black and white. Yeah. yeah. Hi, what's your question? This is for James. I was wondering why you had white hair and Buffy and Angel. Good question. Um, they wanted. It was cool. Yeah. <laughs> they they wanted um, they wanted uh, Juliet and I to be the Sid and Nancy of the vampire set, and Sid Vicious and Nancy. Nancy Spongen. Spongen. Okay. Was uh, they were uh, punk rockers back in the seventies, and in punk rock. It's either black hair or white hair. It's, it's not brown or blonde. It's like a very graphic look. So they spray painted my hair black, and they looked at me and just went, "No." <laughs> this is so nice. Uh, we're really sorry about this, James, because it's going to hurt a lot. But the only other way we can go is bone white. So we're going to have to bleach your hair. And I was like, "Sure." <laughs> And then they did it, and I was just, I was in tears. I was like, this is terrible! <laughs> Smoke rising from my head and everything. Um, uh, but it wasn't the most fun part of the job, but it, it was definitely, it worked. And so, so it was worth it. Yeah. And I guess James only found out the other day, when Joss told us that we were the Sid and Nancy, I always, from my viewpoint, I was Sid. <laughs> your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, James, uh, you've been having some really great guest roles like on Supernatural. <laughs> um, do either of you have some new projects for us to look for? Uh, lots. Let's see. Um, I just, I uh, guest starred on Criminal Minds and that was really cool. Um, I just shot two movies. I uh, did The Bronx Bull, which was formerly Raging Bull 2, and I play a Viennese movie starlet wild party girl that has an affair with uh, William Forsyth, who plays the boxer Jake LaMotta. And then I was just in Africa shooting uh, the female lead in a movie called Where the Road Runs Out, and I play an English missionary in that who runs an orphanage in West Africa. Prior to that, I just produced, and you guys can't see it, unfortunately, but I produced a um, six-month run of the John Patrick Shanley play, Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, in Los Angeles, and it was unbelievable because we got extended. We were supposed to run for a short time, and we got extended five times, and we played to totally packed, oversold, had to add chairs every night because um, we were a critic's pick in the LA Times and got 12 out of 12 raves, and we're getting standing ovations every night. It's just really, really creative experience and 
And um, so I'm kind of looking for the next, I want to read this play. Yeah. <laughs> what, what sort of play did you, and I also produced last year a two evening reading of A Streetcar Named Desire because uh, it was the centennial of Tennessee Williams' birth and we raised a lot of money for the uh, charity Equality Now and I got to, uh, to work on the role of Blanche, which I absolutely loved, really, really loved working on Blanche. And um, I have a new project, but I'm not allowed to talk about it yet, but I'm really excited about it. So soon you guys will be hearing about it. I think a lot of you will actually think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm a reoccurring character on a TV series on Sci-Fi Channel that I'm not supposed to talk about. Uh, I'm in a, a, a French television series called Metal Verlant, uh, which is based on the comic book that gave rise to Heavy Metal, which is a really dark, twisted uh, 80s film of animation. Uh, and my, uh, my part in it is a lot like an original Twilight Zone, one of the black and whites with Rod Serling. Uh, really compact, really uh, horrible ending. <laughs> no one gets out really well, uh, but really interesting. Uh, I've got a movie called Dragon Warrior coming out this year, probably. It's a big special effect movie, so they've been in post-production for a long time, doing all the computer stuff they do so well. Um, that's it for film and television right now. Uh, and then I'm doing the Harry Dresden books, also Vampire Empire, which you can get as a trilogy. Um, and then my band, uh, which is very uh, Ghost of the Robot. Ghost of the Robot is available on iTunes and Amazon. And we've got three albums, and our last one is Selling Like Hotcakes. Still at 106, right? Did you say it was 106 or 200 yesterday? Yeah, on the top 200 list on iTunes, it was 106. Go get it, guys. Let's take another question from over here. Um, hey, guys. I was just wondering, for both of you, if you could change something about your character or something that you did on Angel, what would it be? <laughs> Not a damn thing. <laughs> Every time I thought I had an idea, Josh had a better one. I mean, as an actor, there's always things that you're like, oh, if I could go back and do that scene, maybe I could try this. I mean, there's always things that, you know, you go, oh, that scene could have been, if you want to spend time doing that. But in terms of what they gave us to do, I think we felt really lucky and fortunate with what we were, we were given. Yeah, not a damn thing different. Yeah. So it was perfect. Was that? It was perfect, right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> We're a little short on time, we've got a few more questions in. Yes, right here. Thanks. Um, this question question's for Juliet. Um, one of the things I found so captivating about Drusilla was kind of that crazy, psychotic, but then also scary at the same time. And I was wondering if you had any inspirations for that kind of dichotomous role that you played. Well, it was interesting because when I uh, got hired, I actually never auditioned for the role. I, I met with Joss and David Greenwald, Marsha Shulman, um, um, I'm trying to think, Gail Berman, one of the producers, was in the room. We had this really incredible creative meeting. We kind of bounced ideas off each other. Jo uh, Joss had said um, he'd had Spike and Drew running around in his head for 10 years. And he said that the characters could be in either English or American. I was like, oh no, they have to be English. And he said, yeah, if I can get an English actor or an actor who can him, who can play Spike, I would love that. And so I did a little of what I thought she should be in the room. I think I was talking and kind of like ended up staring at the ceiling for a little bit and did something and they were like, oh. And before I got to my car, my, my agent called and was like, what did you do in that meeting? They want you to do the role. And I was like, fantastic. So Joss, basically, we sat down for a creative meeting and he told me what he, he sort of filled me in on all the vampire lore and what he really wanted from the character of Drusilla and what he'd had running around his head for 10 years. And I remember as I got to that meeting, I was really excited and he started to describe everything and I started to get more and more nervous because everything he said sounded like the complete dichotomous opposite adjective to each other. Like he said, she's very sweet but she's diabolical. She's very childlike, but she's sensual. He said she's, um, uh, you know, really, like she's on top of things because she has visions, but she's out of her mind. You know, he said all these things. And he just kept saying, like, like she's really delicate, 
but she's powerful. And so I, I left the room and I went, oh, <laughs> like, how do you do that? That's like somebody telling you like she's tall and short. <laughs> so, and then I started doing that thing where I like pull the different ingredients. I always like to work with different pieces of music or pull visual references and different stuff and started to kind of put the stuff together. And all sort of she was born and I think it's because Joss also challenged me in terms of saying I want all of this I don't want just one thing and um, and because the writing was so rich that that uh, I did that but the one funny thing is that one of the things I like to do sometimes with the characters I like to do what I call taking my character out and I like to do that because you'll see how people respond in the world to a character and also if you can keep it going in some sort of you know conversation with a person it's very much like a set where, where you have to stay focused but there's lots of extraneous things going on and you can sort of keep your character going no matter what so I have to say taking Drusilla out <laughs> I did that twice I decided to go to a place I, I never have been back <laughs> and I remember that one place I went, it was night, of course, and I went to a, a, like a convenience store, sort of a liquor store, and I was in, in there, and this woman who was really out of her mind was, was trying to buy something, and the guy was really kind of exasperated behind the counter, and he looked over at me, sort of like simpatico, like, oh my god, I've got this crazy woman. And then all of a sudden, he like was just staring at me, and he was like, oh my god, there's two. And I remember thinking like, okay, I think I got it now. It's a great question. Let's go ahead and take one photo. I do apologize, this will be the final question of the day, though. We are running, we're going to fill this room up again for another panel, so. Hi. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, hypothetical situation. Spike and Drusilla end up at Dragon Con. What happens? <laughs> they cosplay Angel and Buffy. <laughs> uh, happy Meals, baby. Happy Meals. <laughs> no, we can't eat our fans. <laughs> this side. <laughs> right on, guys. What a great question to end with. Yeah. James, Juliet, we do appreciate you spending another panel with us today. <laughs> James Marshall and Juliet Landau, ladies and gentlemen. Show them some love. Folks, as you leave the room, if you would, please take all your belongings with you. Don't leave anything. And just don't try to kill each other getting out the